you know, keys to getting good implants or implant placements or anything like that is getting good at extractions and being atraumatic with your extractions too. You don't want to create a lot of trauma. So if you, you know, you see these, these type of cases day in, day out in your practice, right? In the molar region, I prefer not to place immediate implants. And as I said, your osteotomy, when you create the osteotomy for the drill, it always wants to follow the path of least resistance. And if you have extraction sockets, it's going to follow to the path of least resistance, which is a socket, the extraction socket, basically. But your implant's never going to want to go, it's not, the ideal positioning of that implant's not in the socket. It's like usually at the center where the frication is, you know, on a molar area or whatever. But once, even though you create the osteotomy perfectly in the, uh, in the center of frication, once the teeth are gone, you still have all these empty holes, and it's going to want to drift, basically. So that's why it's not ideal to try and place your implants. And also, it's hard to predict ex exact bone level of where it's going to be after it's healed. So it's better to just extract it and graft it. I prefer that procedure day in day out. On our premolar side, it's, you can do immediate extraction. I do, I do routine immediate extraction and placement because it's pretty predictable. Even though you have buccal lingual or whatever, um, it's, it's pretty predictable as far as you know, the healing there goes. And, and there's less, less you know, it's just buccal lingually where it's going to go, not really mesial distally. You know? But with molar areas, there's too many variables. And so I think, and from a restorative standpoint, I think it turns out, I, I noticed that the results are much better when I do like extraction bone graft versus immediate extraction placement, I think. And it's, it doesn't, it's not about being better or better, but you know, oh, like, you know, I'm more experienced clinician than you are and I did more implants that I can do this better. It's not really that. It's just, I think the results are much better if you just do the graft procedure first, I think. Anyway, so I love using like the um, Orban knife. That's one of my things. I mean, it's, everybody has their own preferences of what they use. So I, I go around the tissue to separate the tissue and the tooth from the tooth with it. And so, <clears throat> so I go around and then, and then I'll, whatever, I'll split the tooth. Whatever you, need, whatever you need to do to take your tooth out, you know, as traumatically as possible. Because if you notice, I haven't laid a flap. Like, I haven't really laid a flap. I'm just going around the tooth and just kind of separating the bone and the gums. And then I split the tooth. Like whatever, it, whatever the tooth needs to split, be split in whatever direction, if, if it's buccal lingual, whatever it needs to be split to get out, I, I try and get it out as traumatically as possible. And then so you, you see the socket, it's just the extraction socket. So once the tooth is out, I make sure that there's no granulation tissue left inside the socket. I take a curette, and we talked about it, you know, two days ago or whatever, but you want to make sure that you scrape that bone. You want to hear that solid scrape sound on the bone. You don't want, to, you don't want there, any tissue there at the apex of where the root is or around where mesial this or whatever it is. You, know, you don't want to leave behind any granulation tissue because if you do and you put graft in there, it's going to fail. It's not going to work. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So you have to make sure you get rid of the granulation tissue. And to tell if you got it all out, what you do is you take some sterile water and irrigate, suction it up and take a look. You'll see it should be clean bone, basically, not tissue. If you see tissue, take the curette again, scrape more, scrape more, and scrape more. I keep saying scrape, scrape, scrape. You have to scrape, scape, scrape, scrape, a lot. And then, so I take cortical bone, it's a small particle cortical bone. That's why it's just my preference. I use that, but you can use cortical cancellous bone. I don't like bovine bone because it doesn't, it takes a long time. It doesn't disappear. It just stays there. And I like to see natural bone turn over over time. So I like cortical bone. So anyway, so I use cortical bone. You can mix it with, like, I, use, I sometimes mix it with clindamycin. I sometimes mix it with metronidazole. I just mix it with sterile water. That's another thing that I mix with. Sometimes I take blood. I use PRP. Mix it with PRP, whatever, you know, to make sticky bone, whatever it is that I need. <clears throat> and then we just pack. Pack, 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 I get nice conden condensation. I, I just use a curette to pack too. I just use that curette to pack. I use that curette to clean out and I use the curette to pack. So I'm trying to keep it simple. I don't want to have a whole lot of armamentarium that you have to clean up and sterilize. You know, I want my instrument pack to be simple basically. And then, we, and then so it's nicely packed. So I pack to the level of the crest, okay? That's where I don't want to, you don't want to overpack, you don't want to underpack. You don't want bone like on top of the gums. You don't want too much gum of, above the area because what happens is when they heal, it disrupts the healing, and then you get these bone particles that are embedded in the gums afterwards, if you have too much, okay? So you want to just pack to like the buccal plate, basically. That's what you want to pack to. And then I take a piece of gel foam, okay? Gel foam goes away. It disappears after a week or like, actually, less than a week, actually, it'll go away. But it's just to act as a little barrier, basically. That's all it is, okay? And then I take Vicro sutures, and then I'll suture. The Vicro sutures, PJ, PJ sutures. This, this is kind of a big one. The, the, this one that I used there on that day. So I use that. And then I do a figure eight within a figure eight, basically. So you'll notice that it's like figure eight, and then I put another figure eight. So you'll see, like, see, I have one, the main figure eight starts from here, here to here, and then it comes from here to here to here to here, basically. So it's like two figure eights within a figure eight, basically. So it's like, I just do, a, so you, you can think of an outer figure eight and an inner figure eight. That's all I do, and then I tie. So I do. And then a week later, I see him back for a post-op, and that's what it looks like. You're not going to get primary closure because the tooth is big. It's, it's, not, it's not possible to get primary closure 
within this, okay? But this is like a week later, and then two weeks later, three weeks later, gums heal over, and then you get nice keratinized tissue back up again, on, on top of there again. So that's what, that's what I want. That's what you expect. Why do I use a membrane? Because number one, it costs money. It's a lot more expensive, right? And so if you charge, if you keep adding all these fees to the patients, and patients are like, I'm not gonna do that. That's like too much. Is it necessary? I mean, I don't think it's necessary. This, I've done this many, many times, and it still works very well. So, I mean, I know some, some doctors are like, oh, we put membrane on top, you have to get closure, you know. And then later on, you have to, like, some patients use the non resorbable membranes, so you have to remove the membrane. So, why go through all that? Why go through all that hassle? It's like, this works. It's cheap. Gel foam's cheap. You know, you can, like, you, whatever. A box is like 60 bucks. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. But. So, now, new technique, right? It's called dermabond. It's like a bond. It's glue, cyanoacrylate. It's just glue for the mouth, basically, okay? So, same thing, we pack bone. I put gel foam, but I wait. I wait for the bone, the gel foam to get soaked with blood. You have to wait for it to get soaked with blood. You can't put it on dry, okay? And then you take, so you notice the cotton roll back here, because you don't want it to drip or flow, okay? So I take this, this dermal bond, it's like a bond, okay? I use this, and then I have a little carrier, right? And I, I, I put drops in it, and I, take a, I have a wet cotton pellet on hand, and you dab, it, you dab it on top with the wet cotton pellet. And so once it's on there, right? It, it solidifies immediately, and this is what it becomes. That's like immediate, like that's how hard it becomes. So it creates a barrier, a seal. Like it's temporary, so you got, but you gotta tell the patients, you don't wanna get too much on there because it's gonna flow everywhere. So that's the reason why I have the cotton, cotton pellet back there, okay? And I keep cotton in there to make sure that it doesn't go everywhere. And you just tell the patient, you're gonna notice these like plastic things kinda chipping off, kinda tip, whatever, and they sell pipettes you know, that, that you can carry. So you just soak it up in the, like you just, it's like a little bobber thing at the tip. It's a pipette, right? You can, they, I get it from Shine, but you can get it from Shine. So you just draw a little bit up and you just have it on hand right there. And then you just put drops. I just put little drops, incremental drops, and then I just take a cotton, the wet cotton pellet and just wet it basically. <clears throat> and then, so after like a week later or whatever, to create a seal on top. So this is granulation tissue that you see here after the extraction. So I want all that out. I don't want to leave any of that in there. So we try and we scrape and scrape and scrape to remove everything out and make sure it's nice and clean, basically. None of that stuff is in there, basically. Then we remove all that granulation gunk. We get all that out. I drew some blood, uh, get some, make some PRP. Yeah, and then so got the slugs, whatever. Mix with bone. I didn't make sticky bone at the time. I don't know why. It was, I think it was just, I, 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 I don't know. I was like going back and forth. I'm like, should I, should I document this or not document this or whatever? <laughs> and so, anyways, I made the PRP. So I used the PRP and I put it in the membrane and then I, I sutured this up. And the way how I sutured this is I used a, a modified figure eight, basically. So I actually grab it from here, here. So I want, to, I want to grab the membrane, right? And then I grab the mesial tissue and then I'll go loop around back. So it's like, normally when you make a figure eight, I will go from here to here, right? And then come here and go here to here and tie, basically, right? But I don't, I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm going here to here. And then I come here to here, and I'll come here to here, and here to here, and then I'll tie, basically. So it's like a little bit of a modified figure eight that I use. So it, what it does is it tacks the membrane into the, into the socket and it creates a seal. So that's, that's what, and then I, I also put one, I took one more in the middle, I think, to stabilize the membrane. So that's what I'm doing to stabilize the membrane there. And the membrane will disappear in, in less than a week. It'll go away too, but at least it creates a, you get pretty, you know, primary closure within the first day or whatever. Um, another option is you can take a tissue from the, from the, 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 the distal tuberosity area, and you can cut it out, you know, to, you can measure, size it and measure it, cut out, you know, like fillet some of the tissue out and just put it in there as a plug to seal it up too. That's another option. But that's another site that the patient has soreness and so they're not happy with this. So I try not to do that if I can. So this is a, like a, I, I did bone graft. I took the tooth out, we did bone graft and I'm ready to place the implant. So like this is the case that I was talking to you about earlier. So like this is straight, but this is, has a tilt, right? Because the patient's been missing this tooth for a bit, right? So it's, um, or this is just the way how he was, right? So you have to find a, Kind of a compromised balance, right? You don't want you don't want to place your implant like this because then you have like a mesial tilt here, basically. So you have to kind of it's more ideal to place it more like this, I guess. And so, so this you know, patient has a wide ridge. Actually, the patient has a nice wide ridge, um, and you know, you, this is what it looks like the tissue. So you have you have plenty of keratinized tissue, and so in these type of cases, I I wanted and I talked a little bit about being atraumatic with my surgery. So I just did a punch. So this is beta line. So I'm just I got the patient numb. And then I, I scrub the site with betadine, basically. I do this pretty routinely for most of my cases, unless they're allergic to iodine or you know shellfish. Then I don't I don't use this if they have any kind of allergies like that. But I just do betadine scrub. I create a punch. I, I size. I perfectly put the tissue right there. Right, I size wherever it needs to be, right? And then I create the punch. 
And so I remove the core tissue. So I'm not laying a flap. So this is very traumatic, basically. And the patient has enough of a ridge, so it's not, I'm not really concerned, you know, as far as. So then I start my osteotomy. So I use the initial drill, the next drill, and then I place the parallel pin, and I have them bite. I check to make sure that I like the direction, the functional, the mesial distal angulation, the wherever, you know, the buccal lingual angulation, all that stuff. And if it's off, I correct with my next drill. I make sure I try and correct what I'm off, okay? So I'm taking these precautionary steps just to check. But it doesn't take me very long, so I'm checking. So remember, I told, I told you, I don't want this to be like this. I, just, I want this to be more up and down, right? So that's why this, this looks like that. And then I, I have them bite down to make sure that it looks, you know, it's happy with the functional cusp. And then I, I proceed on, next drill, next drill, whatever, so forth, so, so on. And then I place the implant. So the implant's starting to go in. And then I, it's, it's a, this is a big implant. This is like a 6.0 by 10, I think, or something. So I'm hand driving it in. And then I check with the curette. I go around to see if I'm to the death because you can't see it, right? Because I don't have a flap, right? So it's hard to see. So you feel for the buccal plate and you feel to see where your crest is. And so I take a carrot and I check. That's how I'm checking. And then I place the healing appointment on top. And then, oh, this is, oh, sorry. I don't have the post up pictures anyway. So this one was, uh, I think we're taking this one out and then we're placing one back there for bridge, implant bridge. I think that's what this was. So. I make a lingual crystallized incision here, like it's, you see the buccal hockey stick, and then it, the, it's, not on the, it's not on the crest, it's more lingual, right? And the reason why is I want, because if you look here, it's, there's not much keratinized tissue, there's very, very land. And then you can see where the, muco, the mucogingival junction is like, it's pretty high up, right? So you want to have that band, right? So I'm gonna utilize the implant to, and the healing element to push that out, basically, that's what I want. So I, cr I create that incision on purpose, okay? <clears throat> and then the tooth is out, I took number 20 out, basically. And I, I did an immediate placement. Um, this is a one-day implant, basically, that I placed on there. I drive it down, and the osteotomy has already been created. And so there's a little bit of a jumping distance to the buckle that you can see. So I packed that with bone. So I just put some bone, bone graft material in there. And that, that's a cover screw on there right now, but I'm going to change that to a healing element, like, immediately, because I got good stability with the implant. So I like to create a seal with the healing element if I can. So it's important that you create nice stability with your implant. So once you create the... Because... Now, the tissue has to grow over, right? But if you, if you can cover it up with the healing abutment, then it creates a better seal, right? So there's, no, there's less, chance, less room for the tissue to grow, less, less space for the tissue to grow into, basically. So it makes it better healing overall. And then the back. So I like to place the front one first. Whatever one that I'm going to place, I like to place it first. Why? Because so I can guide myself with it. So I actually placed like an impression coping on here. Something on there, basically. I just try and place something on there so I can use that as a guide for me to guide my angulation of the distal implant that I'm placing. That's what I'm using, basically. So I use that to create my osteotomy. So I have that on there on purpose. So it just helps me guide my orientation of what angle I need to go into. Like either buccal lingual or whatever it is, right? And then so this is another one-day implant that's going in. Um, and then I, I, drive it, I hand drive it down into the depth. And these are the healing elements that I put on there, basically. I, I placed a little bone graft on there because it was a little thin in some of the areas. And there was some bone left from earlier that I'd mixed. So. So I place some bone graft and then I suture them up, but the tissue, her tissue is kind of thin, but it's, this is what it looks like. It's, I, like it's, it's, I get closure, but there's, um, it's still a little bit over the healing movement, right? Not a big deal, but this is what it looks like two weeks later. Look at the tissue. You see the big, thick, keratinized tissue that's building up? That's good. That's what I want. That's, that's the reason why I did the, the, the case like that. And then, so this healing movement is buried underneath the gums, right? So I switch that out. I take it out. I place a taller one. So because it's taller, you have a little bit of a gap on the lingual right now. But as, as she heals, it's going to tighten, tighten back up. And she's already restored, actually. So I, I don't think I added the pictures on here. But that's one of the reasons why I like that lingual crystallized incision. It's still on the crest, but it's more lingual. So you can bring that keratinized tissue to the buccal and add to the tissue. So that's what the old, old healing moment is. It was slightly not down, actually. But anyway, so this is what it looks like, the new one. So it's much taller. So. And then so before to after, you see the difference in tissue and you see the new mucogingival junction forming, it's lower, it's getting lower, right? That's what you want. You want the vestibular depth to be deeper. And that's what happens when they lose teeth. It, they lose the vestibular depth as well too. That's part of the thing that goes with it. And so this helps to main, like, get, get that back. So this is uh, like number four. Um, I think it's number four, yeah. A video of me taking like immediate I'm placement, just the placement number four. So this is me doing beta dime. This is my routine. So patient's numb, I think, already. I think I already numbed the patient. So it's, it's like life. So it's just um, doing beta dime scrub. And then she has tartar back here. Like this is just like a whole bunch of tartar underneath the gums there. She needs SRP, but she hasn't been coming in to do it. But she wanted the implant done, so. <laughs> so okay. So I'm taking 
<laughs> peritome, and I'm scraping off the tartar. I'm trying to scrape off the tartar, but it's still there. It's not coming off, right? Because I'm deciding, I'm still deciding on the fado if I'm going to lay a flap or not, right? Because I, I would just, because she has a pretty nice wide ridge, and so I could have done this case punch. Like, I do a lot of my cases punch instead of laying a flap because, as I said, I like to create less trauma for the patients, and patients like it when there's less trauma because they have less pain. They come back and get more done, so. But in this case, because of the, I couldn't scrape the tartar off, so I, I decide to lay a flap. Yeah, I raise a flap, so I'm making an incision. And she, even though she has plenty of keratinized tissue, I'm still directing my incision slightly lingual to the crest, just in case I need to gain any kind of keratinized tissue on the buckle, basically. So, just very minor. It's not not very major, basically. But she's got plenty of good tissue. <clears throat> And what, the way how I use my periosteal olivary, you'll see here, basically, I love to use a tooth as a fulcrum, okay? Because it doesn't slip. When, the thing is, when tissue tears, it's because when your instrument slips, that's when it tears too. So I put my periosteal olivary in there, and I, I'll use the tooth here against this here, and then I'm just elevating off the tooth kind of to lift the tissue up, basically. That's what I'm doing. So I'm just utilizing the tooth. So I get a little separation, and then once, once it's separated, I'll use the tooth. See, I'm using the back molar to elevate off the, off the molar. And so it just comes right on. There's no slippage, and the tissue comes out clean. It's a clean, clean removal, basically. So there is, I create a little bit of a lingual, and the reason why is because there's all this tartar. I don't know if you can see it on the video here very well, but there's quite a bit of tartar on that mesial of that tooth there, number three. So, so you'll see me taking, see? After this, I guess. You'll see me taking the periosteal elevator. See, I'm scraping. I'm scraping the tartar off that tooth right now. That's what I'm doing. I don't know if this is it's like very visible in the video or not, but that's what I'm doing. I'm scraping that tartar off the tooth right now. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I mentioned it's free SRP for the patient or whatever. So. Almost kind of doing the same thing on the, on the other, other end too. But. And then so, next one, I think it's continuing, so. Then I just do my osteotomies, basically. So I'm going to start my osteotomy and see where, I think I already did the first initial pilot drill, and then so this is an extra 2.2 drill, whatever, the twist drill. And I go down to the depth that I want. <clears throat> and you'll see me put the parallel pin in, right? And then I check the bite. So I just have them, I'm looking overall. I'm, I don't know if you can capture, if the video capture everything that you can see at all. But I tried to see if, if I'm happy with the mesial distal angulation, the buccal lingual angulation, if it's pointing towards the functional cusp or not, you know? So I'm checking all those kind of things with it. And whatever, if I don't like, I'm going to the next drill, but I'm just correcting with the next drill when I'm, when I'm doing it, basically. Most place, single placement cases don't take very long to do. Once you've done a lot, it, it, you tend to move pretty quickly. So I'm just kind of next drill, like doing, going step by step to next drill, next drill to the depth, basically. And you notice, the, I mean, I'm not, I don't try and keep it, like, this one, it feels like it's in there for a bit, but I don't usually keep it in there for very long. I'm going, it's just up and down, up and down, and in and out, basically, so. Now, I think I flipped the, the, the parallel pin again, just to check again one more time. And if you look, yeah, see, I, see, I have the patient bite down, and they usually can't bite all the way down because it's too tall, but it gives you a reference, you know, it's, it's just so that you can see. It's not so that you can have a clear, Clear reference of biting all the way down, but it gives you a reference of where you, what you can see, basically. So, <clears throat> so if you look, if you look uh, just a bit, I, I don't want to pause this because I don't want it to crash. But I'm right in the central. See, I'm right in the like central fossa, right? Central fossa. That's that's where you want to be. That's that's the ideal location. I'm look. I'm thinking of it from a crown down perspective. I just want the tooth to be there. I want my screw hole to be. I'm thinking where's going to be my screw hole, right? So that's my screw hole, and the angulation needs to be here to hit the buccal inclination of that buckle cusp of number, whatever the opposing tooth it is, you know? So I go to the next drill and just go down to depth, my depth, whatever, I think it was a four by 10, whatever that I'm placing on here. So I go to the 10 millimeter depth with my next drill, and I believe we'll just place pretty soon here. And if, if you notice, I haven't laid a vertical releasing flap. It's just an envelope, like a little mini, mini flap, yeah. And the reason why I laid this flap was, I guess, this, number one is to show, show a video for you guys. Number two was just to clean the tartar off, too, that's all, basically, so. 
And yeah, so this is the the next one more drill, yeah, I guess. Maybe it was a four or five. I don't remember what the size was. Maybe it's a four, I don't remember. Yeah, change my settings. And then so it's on the implant. Make sure it's on the slow setting, never on the fast setting when you go to place your, your implant, right? You always slow it down. You slow it down really well. And grab the implant. Yeah, so it's a 4 by 10. That was the size. You notice the foil, it's a sterilized foil on the handpiece. That's what I was talking to you about like two days ago. That's what I do. Because you can't sterilize the, the actual motor part of the handpiece. You sterilize the handpiece. So that part, we try to keep it sterile by wrapping sterilized foil around it to keep it sterile. I just, I'm just trying to lock the implant into the the driver. This is a like an empty active, I believe, four by ten um, one day implant that I placed. And make sure it's going in slow and just drive it all the way down. Remember, you can still change your angulation as you're as you're placing. So I'm keeping that. I'm constantly looking at that. I'm still checking. I'm still making sure that I'm happy with the with the positioning and the placement and the angulation overall. So. And I, I hand drive the rest of it in, basically. <clears throat> I guess there's something I didn't like. I don't remember. <laughs> Oh, I think there was a little bit of tissue on the on the on the something, or there was something on there, some kind of debris or something on there. I wanted to clean out or something or another. I think that's what it was. So I'm just going back in to clean something out. I think I, I think I because I'm I'm wearing loops, so I can see. I think there was something on there that I didn't I saw that's like kind of not shouldn't be there. So I'm just trying to clean it up a little. Or uh, it was too tight. So actually, I'm I'm enlarging the osteotomy. Okay, so I'm enlarging, and I'm enlarging the osteotomy here. It wouldn't drive all the way down. It was too tight. It was going in tight, and it was like too tight. It wasn't. It wasn't um, driving all the way down. So I'm going back to implant driver setting. With, I, so I enlarged the osteotomy to one size bigger, basically. I went up to the next drill. That's what happened. Oh yeah. Now see, I'm just re irrigating because there was some debris I think on the implant. So I'm just irrigating. That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I'm just irrigating the implant. So yeah. There's like a little. Yeah, there's like a little tissue debris. I'm just cleaning that off. Like I try to irrigate it off. I, I I try not touch the implant if I can. I don't definitely touch it with my glove. I never touch it with my glove. And then so if I'm ever touching it, I use like whatever instruments that I have. So I'll hand drive it in real quick and then I'll whatever. Once it gets tight enough, I'll just pop it off and just drive it in with the motor. And if I can't get all the way down, I'll, I'll hand drive the rest of it way down. But if it feels super tight, then I'll take it out and enlarge the hole just a little bit bigger. So So yeah, that's just me driving it down. And it's still a little bit above the crest, so I'm gonna hand drive the rest of it in, basically. <clears throat> I'm just laying the flat back so I can see if I'm to the crest or wherever, you know, as far as the crest goes. So. I think I saw some kind of debris there, so I'm just trying to irrigate, like rinse it off or whatever. So stability is pretty good, you know, like, so you ask, am I over torquing this implant? Um, no, it's not that tight. It's like, it might look like on the video, but it's not that tight. And, on, and I talked to you about this earlier, like two days ago too. Upper jaw, bone's usually not like D1 bone. You know, like I think D2 bone, even D2 bone or D1 bone is when you can have over torquing of an implant. Like you can get compression necrosis if you put the implant too, too tight. So if you're getting like 100 newton centimeters or 120 newton centimeters on the lower jaw, and it happens when you place like these wide diameter implants, they're super strong, they're super tight, basically. If it's that tight, you need to back it out, enlarge the osteotomy and replace it back. 
But on the upper jaw, it's, it's very unlikely. The bone is usually like D3, like D, D2, borderline D3, basically, and so very less likely. And that's what, the, and then that's closure right there after, you know, suturing up, healing of them, and then closure there, basically. Um, and so that's what it looks like. Healing, after the healing, that's what it looks like. A very nice healing. I mean, she, she looks good. She's already restored. I didn't take a, a final photo of it, but that's, that's what it looks like. And that's what it looks like on the x-ray there. So she's already healed up and all done, basically. So 